last time we back. Why are we doing this again? I had to go through this seven days ago with new blood rising, whatever the hell it was called. And now we're doing it with the first ever sold out. Also, the first ever sold out happened in 1997 and that is absolute garbage and it's absolute garbage. So you come up here in my house going, ah, oh, WCW didn't start dying until 1999. No, basically they'd lost the fight in 1997 and then Goldberg came along in 1998 and saved the day for like 12 months and we cow prodded him and it was back in the toilet. And look, I'm not saying that WCW didn't have some truly gold moments throughout that period. Of course they did. I'm just saying when they did drop the ball, my word it careered through the floor. And look, I understand the idea that the powers that be were trying to come up with as well. The New World Order was such a hot property in the late 90s. Why don't we try and have a chain of events that's just dedicated to them? And then we can have more over here that's just dedicated to WCW. This will allow us to run two pay-per-views every single month and we'll double our revenue. And then everybody can swim it around like Scrooge McDuck. And I think that would have killed us all, but really it just comes down to a matter of quality. And by 1997, because World Championship Wrestling never even got a sniff when it came to this battle, every single person on the roster basically wanted to jump across to the NWO. And that's not any kind of narrative, because even if they were super cool, the New World Order was still meant to be the bad guys, and WCW meant to be the good guys, so all of this is just a confusing mess. Described online by some people as the single worst pay-per-view in wrestling history up to this point, and my word, I chuckled. No wonder nobody really gave a damn, because when you got into ratings, WCW Nitro was still absolutely kicking WWF Raw's ass. I mean, there was even talk during the period that maybe Vince McMahon would move Raw off Monday nights, and of course he never would have done that, but he did start the conversation about making sure every single Raw show was live, because in 1997 some were still being taped, meaning we lit the fuse on yet more madness with the Monday Night War. The most fascinating piece of trivia I did read though, was that Sonny was the most download celebrity on AOL, beating out the likes of L. McPherson and Terry Hatcher. So now I know, and you know too. But in front of a deliberately small crowd of 5,000 people to try and make it feel all gritty and badass, it is the first ever WCW or NWO sold out from January 1997. Brace yourselves. Let's up those retro dials. Just the weirdest start to this pay-per-view because Eric Bischoff and Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and Six are all driving bin trucks as if I meant to think that's cool. Now look, if you are a bin man or a bin woman, that's a job that has to be done. Of course, imagine we didn't, we'd all go absolutely crazy, but I couldn't figure out what the hell they were doing. Also, this just goes on forever before Hulk Hogan turns up in a limo, because of course he can't be in a dump truck. Although I can't tell you why, because why was anybody in one? You then head to the arena and we get just the most generic riff ever. It sounds like rock01.mp3. But I won't lie to you, I kind of liked it. For the first time you pick up a guitar and just go dun 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 Fine. It's just too up its own ass, which is the problem as well. Because it takes 10 minutes, that's right, 10 minutes of all this kind of craziness before you get to the first match. And a good portion of this is just our commentators for the evening, Eric Bischoff and Ted DiBiotti going, oh man, you're great, no, you're great, oh, everybody's great. It's like, I don't care who's great, just show me some wrestling. They're also just so nonchalant about anything, which is fine at the start of an hour in, you're like, please, can you start taking this seriously? Although much like New Blood Rising, the first match, well, it's actually pretty good. But you could see this coming a mile off anyway, because it's the narrative that is the massive trouble. Because we had gone all in WCW versus NWO, but so many people fighting for WCW were like bad guys, but now we were made to think they were good guys just because by proxy, they were fighting for the other team. And it just makes the structure of every single fight you get on this evening, well, it's baloney. It's baloney. You may as well have just got a child to write it because that's what it feels like. Anyway, it is Masahiro Chono taking on Chris Jericho, but Eric Bischoff doesn't care about this. He just wants to tell us that old WWF had to give away some tickets through a 7-Eleven promotion. And it was at this point that I remembered that rules don't really count in WCW. Now, this was doubled because it was an NWF show and the referee for every single match was Nick Patrick <laughs> who was a part of the New World Order. So when Chono just got a table for under the ring he was like well that's fine by me I don't give a hoot. Another problem then comes into your view though because this heel official had absolutely run its course by 1997 it was just a really cheap way to get heat. So yes after Chono had chucked Chris Jericho through the table he hit him with another boot and he pinned him for the one two three but look, it is actually quite good because these two are quite good wrestlers. So I'm going to give it an up. But that is only because we are grading on a curve. Fair play to Jericho too, because he was high flying around the place here, which was not common in USA wrestling around this time period. But then you cut to Eric Bischoff and Ted DiBiase, who just go, ha, ha, 
Look who's coming out to sit in the crowd. And it's all the WCW guys that we're meant to be rooting for. And we just made them come across like jokes. Because this was the late 90s too, all of wrestling was just desperate to try and turn on horny teenage boys. Which is why next we had an NWO beauty contest. The worst part about this though, is that this is meant to be a parody on what other companies were doing, but that just makes it even worse. It's all these middle-aged ladies, I suppose, just being told to say how much they hate the World Wrestling Federation, as Eric Bischoff basically flirts with every single one. And every single one of these segments also goes on for around about 15 minutes. I was like, man, imagine it was 1997 and you would pay 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks for this. You would want to take your own fist and just repeatedly hit you in in the face to teach yourself a lesson about what you should do with your money. You've also never seen a live crowd more disinterested and I locked my door when I was watching this and not for the reason you're thinking you dirty little so-and-so but I would have been embarrassed if anybody had come through said door and seen that I had chosen to be watching this. It's bad and it's embarrassing and it's absolutely nuts that somebody signed off on this and put it on my television. I mean, just down, 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 down. Is that meant to be Big Bubba Rogers, the former Big Boss Man, taking on Conan, but for some reason Conan couldn't get there on this evening. So instead, WCW just sent out Hugh Morris. And do you want to know what his nickname was? That right, it was Big Dick. I should have known what was coming. The stimulation here as well was last man standing rules, so you had to answer the count of 10. And for reasons I couldn't figure out, Morris arrives dressed like a Dudley boy. But if you watch the Nitro before this, or you watch the Nitro after this, he's not dressed like a Dudley boy. So what the hell is going on? The whole tone of this match is bizarre though, to the point I had to go read a bunch of reports online because I was totally confused. But the big boss man decides, I know how I'm gonna end this. I'm gonna get on a motorcycle and I'm gonna run over Hugh Morris. And as he does this, Bischoff and DiBiase are just like, oh my God, he killed him. He's gonna die. I'm like, if you don't take it seriously, how am I meant to be taking it seriously? A would-be murderer should never be treated like this. Hugh also had this match one earlier on, but again, Nick Patrick refused to count to 10, but obviously after he'd been hit by a vehicle, he was essentially never going to get back to his feet. So Nick Patrick went one of the other zero nine ten and Raid Trailer won. This was truly, truly unreal. And I cannot believe that it exists in the same timeline that I am now here in. And I also want to make it clear at this stage of Sold Out, you have heard that stinger of New World, New World, New, New World Order around about 57,782 times, and it is way too much. And then all of this continued down. Because it was Jeff Jarrett versus Wall Street, which was essentially his IRS gimmick, but just played out under a completely different name. And I suppose Jeff Jarrett had some momentum because he had recently kind of jumped from the WWF. <laughs> but once more, this match is just exactly the same as the rest. And also the audience is barely making any noise. It was also due to what had come before it, because even though we'd just seen Hugh Morris essentially killed, Deborah and Steve McMichael are at ringside and Deborah could not handle even Jeff Jarrett being kicked. So I'm like, where are the levels here? I'm not meant to care about motorcycle accidents, but when it comes to a boot to the ass, oh my gosh, can't believe it. It also goes so long that eventually they are wrestling to just silence. And the only person who does seem to give a damn is Steve Mongo McMichael. Because when Jeff Jarrett is in an abdominal stretch, oh no, the devastating abdominal stretch, he gets a briefcase and he just starts smacking everything that will move and then gets in Nick Patrick's face and go, oh, you better count the pin. So he does because he's scared. And that's the only way Team WCW managed to rack up a point. So none of this makes any sense. I don't think anybody gave a flub. And I was so disinterested, I started to think, I wonder who the first person was to juice an orange. That's kind of a weird thing to do. You're eating an orange. And then one day somebody goes, oh, I'm going to put in a juicer and says, oh, it's delicious. Let's serve it for breakfast. I don't really understand how we got to that point. There's then more chatting between Eric Bischoff and Ted DiBiase as we go back to that beauty pageant, but I don't want to talk about it for more than I have to. And then Buff Bagwell, I suppose, has somewhat of a historic appearance because it's the first time he hit that blockbuster off the top rope. I mean, that is all the excitement I can give to you down. He's also fighting Scotty Riggs, who once more just gets no support from the audience. And this is just 14 minutes of nothing. It's just like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then Buff wins. And you're like, okay, am I supposed to have any kind of emotional attachment to this? Because if so, I don't. This is why the whole thing failed as well, because it doesn't feel like it's an actual war between WCW and the NWO until you get to characters who we shall talk about later. But if it's going to permeate the entire program that you're showing me, well, you have to make sure there's just a little something, something to grab hold of instead of just this. 
which was just like the eternal abyss. I'd also use this time to let you know that WCW was trying out some kind of handy cam here when wrestlers would do big moves, but it kind of came across like me trying to do some filming while holding a baby in the other arm. It's just so wiggly and wavy and wiggly and wavy. So while I appreciate the effort, it also means that all of this stuff kind of makes you feel sick. So ultimately it was pointless, as was more stuff when it came to the beauty pageant. I couldn't believe this was round three, and just because we got a round three, it's getting it down. It then got to the point where you're like, please, for the love of everything WCW, just give me something. And even though they almost did, they then stole it away from you again. Because yeah, going back to my earlier point, one of the most constant things throughout this whole ordeal was the fact that DDP would never join the New World Order. And he would tease them and he would the diamond cutters and he was genuinely a guy you could get behind and he just understood his role perfectly. It rocked. It also meant you could actually support him and you could actually trust him. And this went for Sting as well because of course this was the period where he was just standing in the rafters watching on. You were like, oh my gosh, that is the coolest person I've ever seen. I hope eventually he starts to hit everybody with a bat and you know the rest. So when you take all of that and then find out we were doing DDP versus Scott Norton here and a bunch of NWO guys came out halfway through and that Diamond Dallas Page pretended he was going to join but then yes started hitting them with his finishing move you'd be like oh great something to hold on to but this finishes when the New World Order chase him out the ring so Nick Patrick goes tee -hee -hee, I know what I can do I'll count him out meaning that Scott Norton won and you're like why couldn't DDP just pin him? Why couldn't you give me even a little something something? We don't deserve nice things. So it's just like taking any happiness I could have had and burning it in a fire. But look, I like DDP so much and he played his role, like I say, so well. I'm giving it an up, but that is the most undeserved up in the history of this show. You then figured out quite quickly who was actually a star when it came to this ball of shenanigans. Because Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, the outsiders, walk out as a tag team champions and all of a sudden the place couldn't give more of a damn and it really, really does help this pay-per-view. They've also taken on the Steiners who came across like the most legit tag team ever and they even get booed because again, everybody loves Hall and Nash. But this is just kept so simple. Scott and Rick just throw Hall and Nash around the place because they're suplex kings. Being in the NWO, Hall and Nash make sure they're cheating. This is what we can do when you just keep things nice and simple. Why do we always overcomplicate it? Naturally, there is a ref bump because I think ever since WCW got hot in 1996, every single match was legally required to have one. But it was also probably because when they were in the back and Eric Bischoff said, so who wants to lose? These four guys went, no. It also happens as soon as Scott Hall hits the razor's edge. So you're like, oh my gosh, there it is. They could have got the victory when Rick Steiner hits the bulldog off the top rope. And because Nick Patrick's been knocked out, Randy Anderson, the WCW ref who's in the crowd, he just runs in and goes, okay, why not? One, two, three. And we technically had brand new champions. But again, it's WCW in around about a week, whenever the hell it was, the decision would be overturned. But I tell you, this nonsense aside, the atmosphere to this is so much better than anything else on Sold Out. I'm going to give it up. WCW then went WCW, but they did it in the most tremendous way. Because if you were a long time watcher, you knew everything in the main event was always a little bit hit and miss. But when you got into that undercard, they had wrestlers like Six and they had wrestlers like Eddie Guerrero and they had stipulations like ladder matches. And when you put all that into a pot, it was love that you received up. The US title is also on the line, so this one is just so easy to buy into. And while nowadays you'd watch it and go, oh man, that just feels like a standard ladder match, it was not the norm back in 1997. So seeing them fly over the top rope and fleeing them fly to the outside and fall off the top of the thing, well, it was kind of exhilarating. And sure, yeah, look, the finish is a little bit squiffy, but I appreciated the fact we were trying to do something new because both Guerrero and Six get hold of the title. Eddie pulls it away. He clogs Six on the head. Six falls down. Guerrero then accidentally drops the title. So he goes, oh, oh, oh. he runs down the ladder and he picks it up, which means he is the winner. And while maybe it wasn't as climatic as they hoped, it still works. It remains a mystery like evolution. Why anybody in WCW didn't see these two guys and go, I think we should probably do more with them. But I don't have to worry about this now. It's 2021, I have enough real problems. Eric Bischoff then kissed the winner of the NWA beauty contest. I just wanna know, who is this for? Eric Bischoff was doing it here. Vince McMahon was doing it all the time on WWF programming. I think this was Eric taking the mick out of that because again, the lady was a little bit older than you would be expecting. I'm like, I didn't tune into wrestling 
to watch two middle-aged people get it on with each other. I mean, I really, really didn't. I don't need that in my life ever. If you want to do it in the privacy of your own home, of course I support you. But all of this, it should never have been on the pay-per-view. To the point is getting another down. All of World Championship Wrestling's major problems then came storming to the ring as we got to our main event. Because while WWE does do this here and there, WCW got into this horrible pattern where if you saw Hulk Hogan going to the ring with that shiny gold belt over his shoulder, you knew no matter what was going to go down, there was going to be some kind of screwy shenanigans and he was never going to win or lose properly. Lo and behold, this. It just meant you stopped believing, which is a terrible trait to teach to any wrestling fan. And it was the same here when Hollywood Hulk Hogan was defending his WCW title against the giant Paul White or the Big Show. Call him whatever the hell you want. And look, in terms of the meat and bones, this isn't terrible as long as you know what you're about to see. And this is still the Paul White that's happy to jump off the top rope and do an elbow drop, which is incredibly impressive. But as soon as he has hit the choke slam, and you notice that, oh my gosh, Nick Patrick is the referee, he goes one, he goes two, then goes, oh my shoulder, I can't count for three. And you'd be like, look, this would be bad enough if you gave this to me anyway during this. But the fact you've already done it 32,976 times in a two and a half hour shot, do you not have any more ideas? This pissed the giant off so much that he choke slams Nick Patrick and that opens the floodgates and here at the NWO and Hulk Hogan smashes a guitar over Big Show's back and then we pull his pants down, which is actually what happened and we go NWO. But you never get a finish. The show then goes off air with Hulk Hogan being this close to the camera going, NWO, what am I gonna do? I'm like, what, that's it? Nothing, no DQ, no count out, no pin, no submission, just nine. So all of it comes together to just ensure that none of this means anything. You get to a main event and you get no payoff. Plus you got no payoff on Nitro. And it is just absolutely head scratching until of course, Paul White, the big show, the giant would join the new world order. It's baffling. <laughs> it's so baffling and it's so bad to watch, which is why it's not just a down, it's a brown down. When it comes to star ratings as well, all you need to know that aside from the ones that have made good to get two to three stars, it's all dud and negative stars here and there because it's absolute trash. I think it's trash. Dave Meltzer thought it was trash and every single wrestling person you can think of thought this was trash. I'll tell you why because it was absolute trash. So no more WCW shows. Not true at all, I'll do as many WCW shows as you want, but do know that if they are of this ilk, I'm going to be a very sad panda. Now please do like the video, share the video and subscribe. Leave a comment below, let us know what other shows you would like us to review and do whatever else you want to do down there. Also go to whatculture.com, check us out there, come say hello on social media and go and watch old retro ups and downs so that when I do have to put myself through this, I feel good because I know you watched it. My name is Simon Miller, thank you for joining me as always. And of course, I don't really get mad. 50% of this is just for show and 50% of this is just absolute confusion because what the hell were we doing?